I think, you know, tech is getting better at helping in the right ways with staff over time. That's certainly promising. Otherwise, I would not be in the job that I'm in if I didn't believe in it. Um, but it's also concerning that some folks, even with technology adoption, um, aren't willing to invest the time to make it useful for them. Mm -hmm. So great example, we're, we're doing intentional conversations. This is to get students to, to know about each other and, and we wanna understand what's going on with our students. And so you can use software tools to take in that information. But if you're not then using the assessment data that pops out of it, it's really not serving any purpose. And so and I, I, now it becomes a burden and time can be a benefit item, right? And and so I, I think tech has promise, but it's also concerning to me of like, how can we make sure that we can use this in the best way possible? Hello, and welcome to Student Affairs Now. I'm your host, Keith Edwards. Today, we're discussing rethinking the RA role. COVID, changing nature of needs of both residents and student staff members, and so much more is leading many folks to rethink the RA role on campus. Today, I'm joined by three folks who have been doing a lot of thinking outside the box about some possibilities. I'm so glad that each of you is here. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and online learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find details about this episode or browse our archives at studentaffairsnow.com. Today's episode is sponsored by RoomPact. RoomPact is a software and educational services company focused on helping residents' life and education departments simplify their workflows and improve student learning and engagement outcomes for residents. As I mentioned, I'm your host, Keith Edwards. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a speaker, consultant, and coach, and you can find out more about me at keithedwards.com. I'm broadcasting from Minneapolis, Minnesota at the intersections of the ancestral homelands of both the Dakota and the Ojibwe peoples. Let's get to our conversation. Paul, Heather, Glenn, so grateful to have you here. Let's have you each introduce yourself and share a little bit more. Paul, let's start off with you. Great, thanks, Keith. Happy to be here. So uh, my name is Paul Brown. I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I work at RoomPact uh, as the director of the campus experience. So I'm the one that helps Schools get the most out of our software. I'm the one that goes and does training, uh, as well as kind of manage our social media and blogging and content and podcast, all of the above presence. Uh, but I'm really excited to be here because you know what? I love spicy topics. And this is a spicy topic, you know, something that that looks at things we kind of take for granted and questions them and thinks about them in new ways. So I'm, I'm ready to dig in, especially with this crew. Awesome. Heather, tell us a little bit more about you. Yeah, thanks, Keith. My name is Heather. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the Director of Residence Life Housing and Student Conduct at Willamette University, which is a private liberal arts college in Salem, Oregon. We also have an arts college up in the Portland area called the Pacific Northwest College of Arts, which has a small residential campus. Um, I just celebrated my year work anniversary, and before Willamette, I was at the University of Oregon for nearly 11 years. Um, and Willamette University resides on the land of the Kalapuya Ilahi, which today they're represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron and the and Confederated Tribes of the Sluts Indians. I'm really excited to be here as well. Thank you. Awesome. And Glenn, for anyone who doesn't know you from the podcast, tell us a little bit more about you. Goodness gracious, it's kind of weird being on the uh, other side, right? It's trade trade uh, chairs. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Glenn de Guzman. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Associate Dean of Students and Director of Life at UC Berkeley. I'm coming to you all from Livermore, California, which is the ancestral home and still present day home of the Ohlone Mwekma, the Chochenya speaking people. And uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I mean, aside from just running residential life, I've been in the field for now 30 years, closing in on that. So I feel just don't, don't let this boyish, young looking face fool you. <laughs> I am an, an old dude. So happy yeah. to be here. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad to ideate and innovate and brainstorm and throw out some, some strange ideas. Uh, but maybe we'll begin uh, with how this kind of came together. And I'll just say, uh, we were thinking about this uh, as a podcast host team and seeing some of the blog posts that RoomPact was doing with different folks chiming in around this. 
And I said, oh, yeah, I'm thinking about doing this. And Glenn's like, I want to be on. I've got things to say. <laughs> Can I be a part of this? I was like, OK, sure, that's great. Uh, reached out to Paul, who's doing some work with Heather on this. And so, uh, so glad to have all of you here. But Paul, maybe you can tell us um, maybe how that came to be with sort of Room Pact and the blog and some other things and kind of frame things a little bit for us. Yeah, sure. So um, COVID, right? <laughs> I think this is really due to COVID. I mean, when we think about the RA role and rethinking it, it it's needed to happen for a long time. But COVID was really that inflection point that made people go, whoa, this isn't, this isn't working. And it's, you know, most famously, it was George Washington University back in 2001 that said, okay, we're going to upend this whole model, shift around roles, um, really kind of break apart the RA role uh, quite a bit. And I think that's what really kind of kick started it off um, for, for a lot of folks. So um, there are other institutions that, that have kind of experimented with this. Arkansas Tech, there's a uh, on RoomPack's own podcast, Res Ed Chat, we chatted with uh, Luke and Delton there at Arkansas Tech. They did something very similar to George Washington uh, in terms of breaking up their role. And it's just continued to get a lot of energy. If you go to conferences, you know, I went to the first in-person at Kuhawai post start of the pandemic and packed house rooms, like overflowing into the hallway that there is just so much energy around this um, that, you know, I've been like, Let's let's go with this. Let's see where it goes. And so we did a, a, a blog series on, on the Room Pack blog where different voices from across the field talked about here's what I think or here's my take on the future of the RA role. And then kind of as you mentioned, you know, Heather, myself, and a few others are presenting at a Kuhai upcoming this summer, uh, where we're doing from the RAs themselves. So we interviewed RAs. What do you think the future of the role? What's working? What's not? And um, there's just a lot of energy, uh, not as many people doing the, the work and the experiment with it yet, but I think right. exploring the topic and being what's going on here. So I think that's kind of where we, we kind of enter into the conversation. Yeah. I think that's a really great caveat because I think, uh, you know, we had some folks who we invited who said, you know, I, I think about this a lot. I've got a lot of ideas, yeah. but we're not ready to do that. And I don't want to get ahead of where my campus is. And so, um, so, but Glenn, couldn't wait to get in yeah. here and talk about this. Why? Tell us, Glenn, where's the well, uh, No, I think that that's, that's an interesting thing because I think that, you know, I went to an ACPA conference. My last ACPA conference, believe it or not, was in 2016. So bad Glenn. Um, but when I went to that conference, it, we I went to a uh, workshop on just mental health and just looking at trends and they were already identifying trends. And I, and and I think that there was a when I when I think about where I work at UC Berkeley, I was already starting to see a little bit of that as early as like 2017, but I wasn't sure how to put you know I mean it's it was still kind of like emerging and so it was really difficult to just to name at the time. We had conduct data which was pretty consistent, but what we were seeing at, at Berkeley was uh, a starting to see an increase in students of concern, meaning students were coming in and uh, we we're starting to identify some mental health concerns and issues. I had an interesting conversation with our, we were fortunate to have a psychologist at UC Berkeley who works very closely with our res life and, and they primarily work with our residential students. But he pulled me aside because we, you know, we meet regularly and he's like, Glenn, I'm starting to see more and more of your RA staff mm -hmm. and more and more of your resident director staff. And that was sort of like the beginning of starting to piece together, hmm, what's going on here? And so we began, I began investigating. I was able to connect with Washington State University. They're doing the stress anxiety survey. We were fortunate because Dr. Jason Lynch, who does a lot of research on staff wellness, worked at UC Berkeley. And so he did a study and using some of his um, scales and, and evaluations confirmed that, you know, a lot of the work that our RAs were starting to shift and they were, they were dealing with a lot of secondary trauma. And so it just it began this investigation. And I think the pandemic, to Paul's point, really was that big, because I think that's when I started able to have more conversation with my peers and colleagues about what is happening. And, and it, it, be, it began this kind of journey to like start to deconstruct the RA role. Where is all that work coming? And for us at Berkeley, it was tied to addressing mental health concerns within our residential students. Yeah, I think that's a big factor that I hear driving is that folks aren't saying they're student of concerns they're not going up. They're going up exponentially. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how do we navigate that? And I think that's a mix of what people are experiencing in the world and bringing to campus. I think it's part of we're better at it. 
And so we're identifying more issues and more things and, and we're, we're connecting with students. Students are better at it. They're better at identifying. Uh, mm -hmm. Their parents are better at identifying. They're, they're connected. And yeah. so that the needs are just going up. Heather, what has sort of brought you to this? Yeah, I mean, in addition to the changing current student culture, I just, I keep thinking about um, opportunities to align for, for a curricular approach to drive the structure of, of what the resident advisor role could be. And so part of, I worked with a brilliant person, a wonderful human named Miles Marrow, who was at the University of Oregon. So post pandemic um, COVID, um, with underneath his leadership, he created a structure to really drive home our learning goals that were related to resident advisor position. So really elevating our returning student leader position and aligning those within our learning goals and tying their work to a positional person that would help drive the structure. So they would be they would have like a cohort of um, of just consistency with some of the initiatives that they were doing. And so I just keep thinking about how does the curricular approach drive the structure as well as conversation, learning with peers. I've realized that is, you know, every institution has their own different student culture. So what I experienced at my last institution, I couldn't ever replicate here at Willamette because our students are very, very different. And so um, in addition to everything that's been said, there's also a recent article that came out from Akuho. Um, it's called Changing Traditions. The RA role is undergoing major changes as, a, as members shape it to the needs of their campuses. So it highlights a lot of the work that has happened with George Washington, Arkansas Tech, and some other institutions. Um, and something just to highlight one of them, Texas Christian University talks about really revamping their RA role um, to have residents feel like their RAs are friends. And so that was kind of like their goal of wanting to, for their RAs, for their residents to see their, their RAs as friends. So they use this concept of knowing, connecting, and empowering of how they train resident advisors. And so I get excited when I think about different institutions being able to hone in on what's special about their institution and how do you create these positions that are more helpful to obtaining what you would want people to do. So a lot of connections, conversations with peers um, is how I enter this conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how kind of how we all got instigated into this. Uh, let's dive in a little bit more about some of the details uh, and then some of the possibilities uh, Glenn, what what are you what are you seeing out there, and what are you starting to really what's really driving this? What's driving it for me is, um, you know, I think that as a student first professional, um, you know, we we I like to believe that as a profession, we we really pay attention to the well being of our staff, uh, of the people that we work with, and it's it was easy. Well, it wasn't easy, but it was but it was noticeable that that staff were just having more difficulty in, in, in bringing their full selves to work. Um, I was, you know, we were seeing a lot of tired staff, a lot of, a uh, lot of response to type of issues that was occurring. And in 2000, I think it was 16 or 17 Berkeley, we, we decided to just do a simple time audit. We initially wanted to look at the resident director staff, but we also just on a whim decided let's just also measure the RA staff. We were we were basically tracking where are where are our residential life staff spending their time, mm -hmm. and I and to the point that was made earlier about like we were just starting to see mental health increase. It was it was crazy to see how much time was now being spent on on addressing uh, crises uh, of that nature. Um, and and when we look at what the traditional RA role is, the math wasn't adding up anymore in terms of the number of hours that we have allocated to RAs to do the work. It just didn't add up. If you think about the time it takes to do programming, building trust, building community, they got duty, they got conduct, all that, you know, we have a good idea of how many hours it takes to do that work. But what we didn't anticipate was the time it takes to address mental health crises, roommate conflicts, people coming in with, with just different types of challenges. And then to top it off, we're asking resident assistants, we're asking students to then recover from stuff like that. This is not their primary job, they're students first. So the recovery that's needed, um, you know, it, it was something like, how do we address helping students recover when they've had a long night when they've had to deal with certain types of issue they've never had to deal before. And then you also have the resident director staff who are also trying to support that. So we were starting to see like, we need to really look at 
what type of train I mean, with a training was starting to we were we felt like the solution was add more training mm-hmm. all that did was just means that they became better aware of how to identify stuff that was happening and then we started to realize wow we really have a chat we have an issue here because it's not the 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 students um that we are supporting and uh, are having issues and we're picking up these uh, the concerns they're having but we didn't have the bandwidth anymore and so it really started thinking like, are we doing this right? Are, should we be relying on our resident systems to be addressing a lot of this stuff now? Because it, it didn't feel like, it didn't feel right anymore. Well, when we add training, we often add it to the August training or whenever your pre-arrival mm-hmm. is. And then now you're at 10 days or, or two weeks or more, which then means there's fewer students who can be in the role because they have summer jobs or other commitments or other things. Mm-hmm. You start to, um, I've seen lots of schools when they add to training, um, the, the diversity of their staff. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, let, let me give you an example. Um, first aid, mental health, yep. right? That's a newer type of training that we introduced. And just providing that knowledge to staff, they are starting to identify stuff that like yeah. maybe historically, we ju- it's just a miss. Now it's like, okay, now you just have more and more and more volume. And, and it's reflecting in the data we're collecting. Like that we're just seeing numbers go up. Heather, what are some of the possibilities that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, to echo what Glenn has shared, I mean, the student culture, it's it's changing. And so I, I think often about student leaders, student employees, how are they, how are we equipping them to do appropriate tasks as students? And so as I'm learning more at Willamette, it's a it's a fun time to be at Willamette to start here. We have this brand new strategic plan. We have the divisional of curricular approach that is launching and we're working on that for this upcoming fall. So I think a lot about how these the strategic plan, the curricular approach, how that is going to tie into the resident advisor role. And it's one reason why I haven't even touched the RA role, a little bit modifications, I'll share about that, uh, but why I haven't like really revamped it for, for the most part this first year, because there were other priorities that we I really wanted to spend time on that were essential to our residence hall program that we were, we were initiating. But, you know, I think about equipping RAs to do work that is appropriate for their roles. Um, we did a time audit this past year, we just asked RAs three times during the semester, what, how are you spending your time? And from that, we've been able to understand a little bit more about how they're engaging with residents, to understand a little bit more about what our residents are needing from a resident advisor role from that position. So it's been interesting to try to think a little bit more about how our student leaders are engaging with residents. Um, I do think that at the, at the end goal at Willamette, we will most likely have some specialized positions for resident assistants and resident advisors, um, and that could atten- initially be a cost-saving initiative. So I also think that when budgets are strained at some institutions, like being able to revamp and, and do that could be a cost-saving initiative, which has been what other, uh, what, what other people have shared that has been a, a byproduct, not necessarily that saving money was something that they wanted to do, but it was a byproduct of after the yeah. structure that they built, mm-hmm. they saved money. And so I think I think about those things too. Yeah, that's one of the things I'm hearing folks talk about is uh, it used to be build, build community on the floor and then do programming and now do duty. And we need you to do some desk hours. And now we want you to also do student learning and intentional company. We just keep adding to this role. And um, it's a lot, which you both pointed to, but also people aren't good at all of those things. And so people who would be good at some things are saying, well, I don't want to do the role because I don't want to do that part of it. And be, by being able to break apart the role, some people really want to do like the customer service desk and checking things and others are really interested in duty and being of service and after hours and conduct and really engaging that. And others are really, so by breaking it apart, it's a bit more manageable and you can find people like who are really connected, energized, have skills around this without having to be, you have to do these 13 different roles. Well, it's hard to find people who are good at that and hard to find people who want to do that. What are you, what's, what's driving this for you, Paul? Yeah. Well, in comments and what you just said as a case study of one who was an RA, I can mention many things I was not good at in that RA Same. role. <laughs> Bulletin boards, <laughs> top of the list. Top of top yeah. of my list too. So no. um, <laughs> I'm going to throw a little bit of a different one in here. I think there's seeds of it in kind of what, what Glenn was saying. But, um, you know, one thing that's been really great for my kind of career trajectory is I work adjacent to higher ed right now, mm-hmm. right? So I had, I had enculturated, I had 
gone straight through, did my master's, did that very traditional path, worked in higher ed my whole life, and then plopped into a very young company that was only two years, two years old when I started with people that were 10 years my junior. <clears throat> and the, the work was different, mm -hmm. meaning in, in higher ed, everything is email. Everything is centered usually around Microsoft Office, although that's mm -hmm. less so now. And there's certain work norms that are just expected in higher ed. And then I come into this young company where the way of working is different. I would say more modern, um, mm -hmm. which is probably more likely what our students will find when they go and work uh, in the workforce. It's not going to look like higher ed uh, in terms of the way that we do, do our job. And it gave me appreciation for how the world of work has changed. And what our students are going to expect and what they're going to do is different. Um, and there's different ways of doing it. Remote work, you know, can we think differently about the way things are structured? And uh, um, one of the things that I've seen with a lot of schools that have gone down this path is that they realized, oh, we need to make these positions more flexible. Like you kind of said, Keith, with, you know, making students come back for two solid weeks of training in August is going to cut out a whole bunch of folk. Yeah. Um, so should we be rethinking that? Should jobs be able to be moved between? That was one of the cool things that, uh, Arkansas tech talked about is, you know, traditionally, if you're a, an RA and you need to student teach, you can't be an RA anymore when you student teach. They said, but one of the benefits of changing the role was, oh, you're currently in a more RA like capacity right now. Well, you could shift over to this other position in our department, which will be much more flexible with the way that you go about things. Mm -hmm. And you could do both. And mm -hmm. I, I think for me kind of thinking through like, you know, what's driving this is we need to rethink what does work look like and how is it structured? And it's usually from a group of higher ed folk that in a little bit of bubble of here's how work's structured. It's very traditional and we can keep mm -hmm. going down that path that haven't been challenged in that way. And I know for me, when I stepped outside of the institutions and started working for a company, I was like, whoa, yeah. okay. I have a better appreciation for it now than I did. And I think I appreciate looking at the RA role of like, it doesn't have to look in that traditional mold. There might be ways that we could do. I mean, heck, at this rate, we're going to have chat GPT could just counsel our students <laughs> for us. We wouldn't need to do anything, right? <laughs> what could go wrong there? What could uh, go wrong? What possibly could go wrong? <laughs> One of the things I, uh, and I, you know, Paul, you and I work with lots of different schools, right? Rather than having a deep institution, so we hear lots of different stories. One of the things that I talk about with the curricular approach is you have to rethink everything. You don't have to change everything, but you have to be willing to just consider it for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's what I'm hearing from all of you. Like, how do we, how could we, what, what are we unwilling to consider shifting and why is that? And what if we considered it? And if you can consider it and you go, actually, what's, what we've been doing is really the best thing, then yeah. you're even more committed to it. But I think that willingness to rethink everything without feeling like we have to change everything. Cause then that gets overwhelming and you feel like, why is what we've been doing bad? And, um, but, but willing to open that up. Uh, I want to move us into some possibilities. Can I? Can I add? Can I? Yeah. Can I chime in on that really quickly? I, I like what you just said, Keith. Like, I think that there is this thought process of like trying to rethink, um, like trying to rethink, like just the whole, um, the big picture of things. Mm -hmm. I oftentimes struggle with, as you know, as a director, um, the bandwidth to even change just a few items, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think as the workload continues to increase, you know, and uh, to I wanted to also chime in on what Heather had said earlier about. Um, looking at, um, you know, RA roles and trying to create work that's more appropriate for the role instead of like, because I think over the years, I think we've just sort of like expanded um, the role of the RA to try to encompass things because maybe there just wasn't enough professionals that have to deal with stuff, mm -hmm. right? And 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 what would happen if you were to just really get the, the RAs to, uh, to cut out some of that stuff and really just focus and center in on what Maybe some of the 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 co-curricular approach, right? Like just focusing on one mm -hmm. aspect of that, so they can so they can be a student first, and then also be a support mechanism for the the students, you uh, know, in a in a, in a um, balanced way. Yeah. So I, I think that there's some interesting talking about. I can, I'm sure it's I'm, I'm given the questions we're going to be exploring. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure I can talk more about that as well. But I just wanted to comment on those two things. I I agree with what was shared. Yeah. 
Paul, let's come back to you when we think about possibilities. What are some of the things that you feel can uh, might be out there if we rethink? What, what how do we kind of open the door here a little bit? Yeah, yeah. T to me, you know, I've been a, a faculty member on the Institute on the Curricular Approach, formerly the Residential Curriculum Institute, for a double a digit time. year, a double <laughs> digit year number, and. Um, I can't in my head divorce the two topics because to me, they're completely related. The curricular approach says, well, let's rethink how we're going to develop this kind of program educational model into something else. And part of that is always, well, then we'll need to relook at our staff as well, right? And to me, they're just so intertwined because you can't change the role without really knowing it, what are your goals and what do you want to do and what outcomes do you want for students? And so to me, they're very much related. Um, one thing that Arkansas Tech, when I when I spoke with them, that, that kind of resonated with me that I didn't think about before we talked about it was uh, when they kind of moved around their positions, they took the programming out of the RA position entirely mm. and they centralized it. And so they have a program team and he said, well, we've got our curricular goals and outcomes. And there are certain things that we want to use through a programming method, you know, as a strategy for engaging our students. So our program team will do it and they'll go into each hall and do it in each hall. So it's more consistent. They can get better at it over time, you know, year over year, that program can, can continue to improve. And they removed it from the RA position and gave it to this new position of people that really like to program and are really in jazz and engaged by that. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, well, that's hitting multiple outcomes, right? Like right. you're engaging your best student programmers at the things that they're passionate about, but now you're making your student experience more consistent and you can more consistently assess your learning outcomes because you have that, you're gaining exposure to things. And um, I think it's rethinking things like that that really... That's that's exciting to me. That's, I think, okay, I see where this could go. And if we extend that further, where, where else does that, that go into? I, I think that's kind of the thing that aha'd me to think, oh, yeah. Right. Glenn, what are some possibilities that you're hearing about, thinking about, or maybe you're just beginning to kick around? I think we've we've been kicking it around, and I think we've we're moving in a direction where we are um, kind of to Heather's comment earlier. I'm stuck on that comment, Heather, that you shared earlier, because we are starting to look at what would happen if the roles were sort of parceled out a little bit, right? So I know that um, we recently re-inherited the uh, uh, it, what used to be called the security monitor program, but it's really a safety ambassador program, like um, having non RAs. Um, staff at the front desk in the area. So, and giving them, alleviating or relieving some of the, the burden that RAs have with identifying students who might need some support or help. Um, we're, we're working closely with um, other departments. Like we have a health worker program to help with some of the, um, uh, you know, you know, fentanyl education, um, sexual health education, like those type of things. And, you know, not having all the pressure on the RAs. So really looking at how we can partner with the campus to kind of alleviate some of the, mm -hmm. the burden on the resident assistants. Um, and then crisis response is the big one. You know, I think that we're one of the, we're starting to move in the direction of a mobile crisis unit overnight. So it also, again, alleviates the pressure from the RAs. Mm -hmm. Um, that um, is that has started at UC Berkeley, so we're gonna, we're in the process of measuring and um, assessing to see its effectiveness. I think the um, the strategy that I wanted to just kind of uh, focus in on is we have the data to show that that our resident assistants are impacted. I mean, we've done we just uh, you know my vice chancellor, our dean of students, uh, our assessment person, and I we did an article just specifically looking at our hall staff post. Um, the impacts of the pandemic and and looking at their wellness. And so we have an idea of how um, how what 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 the issues or what are some of the challenges that they face in, in this next generation of, of staff to me and what we 
have put in place as we're trying to come up with more, um, as we try to institutionalize some strategies is really giving the, the supervisors, the RDs, the system directors and residential life, the flexibility to make decisions on their staff wellness in, in a greater degree. We want consistency definitely throughout the department. So we do a lot of calibration conversations, but if we feel that we need to pivot shift, change, things within the control of our policy that we have in place in regards to what it is to manage a hall staff, we give the supervisors the ability to make those shifts and changes. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're finding is that a lot of the decisions are making is tied to giving uh, more um, breaks, flexibility, recovery time for the hall staff, just to, to get through the whole year because it, it can be mm -hmm. daunting. And then at the same time, we're also thinking about bench strength amongst the pro staff because the pro staff who have to do all this work to supervise all the RA, they're burning out. So how do we, as, as the director, the directors, how do we give them the ability to take time to, um, to center and, and focus on work-life balance? So mm -hmm. where it, it's not just like what's happening at the ground level, but at the right above the ground level, you keep going up the kind of like the, the, uh, the hierarchy, uh, for lack of a better term, we have to start really looking at the wellness of staff so people are just not burning out. Um, yeah. And it's not easy. It's really not easy. I want to highlight two things because I think you talked about partnerships. And I think one of the things that um, I'll say we, Housing and Residence Life folks, I did that for a long time. Uh, we think we have to do it all, right? Students mm -hmm. are yeah. experiencing whatever. There's this need, there's whatever. We have to do it all. We have to do it all. And I love that you're talking about partnerships and who can we bring in? Who can we connect? So we don't have to do it all, but the students' needs can be better served. I think that's a great reminder for all of us. Yeah. And I, I think uh, the other thing, I, uh, and I'll compliment you, so mm -hmm. let me talk, Glenn, uh, is, I, Glenn, I think I hear this again and again from you. I think you and your team at Berkeley do such a great job of really thinking about policy development to better serve students and to create more flexibility. And I think oftentimes policies feel like they move away from that. But I hear you again and again, looking at policies. How, what do we need to do with policies to create more openness, more humanness, more serving this, more flexibility so we can better serve students. So I think that's a that's a great thing that you you pointed others to. Well, and can I ask Glenn a question here? Yeah. So I'll jump in and, and ask. too many oh, hosts right the, now. Go that's for right. It. I'm taking over the takeover, <laughs> transfer the hosting responsibilities over here. So you mentioned the, the mobile crisis team, or I'm not exactly sure how you uh, termed it there. I think when I talk with people about this, the hardest thing they can't wrap their brains around, and I struggle with it too, is how do we handle the crisis? How do we mm -hmm. handle the after hours things mm -hmm. that are, you know, burdening all levels of our staff, not just the student staff, but are usually our frontline professional staff too. This is the hardest one that I think are people like, I don't understand how this works. I don't know how we can do this in a manageable way. Do you... What's your magic answer to that? Or what's your magic answer? <laughs> like, we're, like we're solve gonna, the problem yeah. for us. No, you know, it, it, well, one, money, you know, the the the, the cost to uh, mobile question. Here's an interesting story, Paul, because this actually occurred, I want to say pre-pandemic and starting to blur together, but pre-pandemic, I was approached by some of my colleague in health services and they were talking about the utilization of social workers to assist with crisis response to help you know, the, the resident systems, because we would be bringing this different level of response. Like, uh, you know, they, these are folks at the university, they're being trained at the university. This is their, this is what they do. And I'm like, wow, let's explore this conversation. And I, and I started talking about what the, it, it, it felt really good until I said, and we need them after hours. And they're like, oh no, no, we were hoping an eight to five type of room. Sure. I'm like, <laughs> that, that doesn't work that way. Yeah. So th that kind of killed that conversation because they're students too, but they want to do it within their workday. So how did the university solution for, you know, for years now has been like, let's use our hall staff because the hall staff are the folks who are there 24 hours a day, but, but the preparation, the training that's needed isn't there. So this mobile crisis unit that emerged is really interesting because it is dedicated after our staff. Um, and they, and I think what we're learning right now is how does that dedicated after our staff work with our hall staff? who are still going to be present, who understand the vibe, the energy, the culture of the community that the this group is coming in. And yeah, there are things that we're still trying to address because they, you know, they they are learning what it means to come into a student environment, to a residential community. And I think that's still 
you know, I think that's one of the things that we're paying attention to, some of the things that kind of already has been elevated. And it's not like, like, oh my God, it's it's a complete failure. But what it means is we have to go back and do that whole research cycle. Like, what did we learn? Mm -hmm. What are the things that we can do to re-educate, to, to get everyone on the same page? Uh, how do we work better together? And it's not just the mobile crisis unit and the hall staff. You have UCPD, we have, uh, sorry, police department, we have a fire department, we have, um, you know, depending on who responds, um, the, the level of support will vary because sometimes it's a new RA and the RA maybe not be as comfortable versus a, a more senior RA or a resident director. So it there's a lot of variables that plays in. And these are the things that we're trying to measure and track, but it is a lot. And oh, so yeah. we're going to have to pick one or two things and focus in on for the next iteration when we get around to it. So this is and a I really interesting year for us. I think that iteration is so important. I think so many times people feel like we have to figure out the perfect solution and then yeah. implement it. Whereas you're saying, well, let's try something, let's figure it out. What worked, what didn't work. Okay. We got to adjust here, adjust here and sort of build something over time. Heather, what are some of the possibilities that you're seeing? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to share all my secrets, but, um, <laughs> oh, you're holding tell back. It, tell it, tell you're it. holding <laughs> back. You know, you know the answer already. Then here we go. <laughs> um, so appreciative inquiry is a is a process yeah. that helps facilitating change. And when I was at UO, Lori Lander, who was a director of Red Life and Academic Initiatives, did this. And as a participant, I always loved the process because it helped participants think about what is like what what were the possibilities. So it takes people through this discovery, dream, design, destiny phase. And so I actually replicated some of that and adapted that to my organization in the fall semester. And from that, we created our new mission, vision, values. But then also we came up with four projects that we wanted to work on. And so I think appreciative inquiry. Side note is a tool that can be utilized for people who are looking to revamp the RA role in some ways to help create buy-in um, at all levels of an organization. But from these, uh, from this process, along with mission, vision, values, revamp, we aligned four initiatives that we wanted to do. And one of them was a resident advisor role. And it was really important for me to get that right, as right as one could. So we started first with um, living, learning communities, theme communities, as well as um, sophomore experience transfer students. And I had us all this spring semester do research and benchmarking projects. So I invited everyone from the division to come alongside and do research and benchmark. What are other institutions doing? What does research say is a best practice? And create some different strategies for our Res Life Housing Department. So we presented that. Anyone from the division was allowed to come get feedback. And we um, incorporated that feedback for our final kind of process. So this upcoming year, we're doing some of our initiatives within that. And so now that we have the structure kind of set for these research and benchmarking projects, I also worked with the library and they created us a website for us to easy, easily have a landing page to teach people how to do research if they weren't necessarily doing that on a regular basis. So mm -hmm. I get excited because the second year that I'm here, we're going to be doing this um, with the resident advisor role. So I keep thinking about um, creating buy-in and doing that as a new employee. Um, and then in addition, you know, I, I brought in the Dean of Admissions this last fall and I, I said, what are students saying? Like, what are our incoming students saying? And part of the review that admissions do is a holistic review of our students. And they said they are seeking connection, but they don't know how to get it. They are seeking connection. They don't know how to get it. And so that has been like the motto this whole year for our resident advisors and our team is like, how are we building connections? And so we've created, it's not innovative, but hall councils, it wasn't something, it stopped during pandemic, but I really want the, the social programs to not happen with resident advisors and really be a peer-to-peer -peer thing. So yeah. really seeking information from our, our deans and admission staff of what our students coming in with and what and what do they aspire to be. So it's been really exciting, the small tweaks that Aaron Hukari, who's the associate director, and I have been doing this year. So it's been really awesome for this upcoming year. Um, anyway, so those are some of the things that I've been contemplating and considering and thinking yeah. about. I think that's great. We It makes me think we should do a whole episode just on appreciative inquiry, because I think that this is really fabulous and widely applicable. And I love that you're getting admissions to inform what you're doing. I would encourage us to talk to admissions about what housing residents life folks are doing, because often the stories they're telling are really outdated. Um, <laughs> and to be present, here's what's going on. Here's what the resident experience is so that when you're talking with folks, uh, you can do that. Uh, well, we're going to try and quickly get two more questions in. Uh, rapid fire-ish, Heather, what's most promising 
what's most concerning? Yeah, I mean, we've said it here, staff are strapped for time. So I think about what is essential for the team that I work with to be doing. Um, at small colleges, we wear, mo wear multiple hats. So really being essential with that work is important for me. Um, and then buy-in and teaching other people about what Res Life Housing staff do. Keith, you just talked about that. But I think there's potential misconceptions about the opportunity mm -hmm. that our team has within a residential campus like Willamette of what we're doing. We are not, um, there's a lot of misconceptions. So I think speaking that language and talking about how we are educators enhancing the student experience is something that I consistently do on a regular basis. Um, and I'm really excited about continuing collaborations and working in a residential campus when we have a two-year live on a requirement. The possibilities are endless, but time is not endless. And so really being able to think about those initiatives are, are important to me. Time and money is the crunch, right? <laughs> Isn't um, it always? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paul, what, what about you? What's What do you find really promising? And are, are there things that you hear people rethinking that's concerning? Yeah. So, I mean, my day job is working at a software company, right? So my a lot of my days are spent um, looking at our software, thinking what's going to help people get be more efficient in their work? What's going to help them surface information for them to make informed decisions about things. And one thing I've learned in, in doing this for a while that's both promising and concerning is I think, you know, tech is getting better at helping in the right ways with staff over time. That's certainly promising. Otherwise I would not be in the job that I'm in if I didn't believe in it. Um, but it's also concerning that some folks, even with technology adoption, um, aren't willing to invest the time to make it useful for them. Mm -hmm. So. Great example, we're, we're doing intentional conversations. This is to get students to, to know about each other and, and we wanna understand what's going on with our students. And so you can use software tools to take in that information. But if you're not then using the assessment data that pops out of it, it's really not serving any purpose. And so- and I, Now it becomes a burden and time can now, it, now it's a, a benefit item, right? And, and so I, I think tech has promise but it's also concerning to me of like, how can we make sure that we can use this in the best way possible? That's literally my job description is to, <laughs> to try to help people do that. And so I, I think about that all the time, but I think it's part of the solution to this, what's the future of the RA role and how do we make work-life balance better for staff and manage that? I think, I think tech has a role to play in that um, as well. And the right short choice. of again, chat GPT be taking yeah. over our roles and you know. Well, but I, I think that's a real danger, them. right? The right tools can really help you. But then I also see people just adding tools and tools, and we bought this and we bought this and we yeah. bought this and we bought this. And now it's like we don't know how to run any of it. We don't know how to utilize any. So what are the right tools that can really help us either with efficiency or improve their quality? Yeah. And use use humans to make that the best that it can be, right? Yeah. Um that I think that never that never disappears from the equation. Yeah. Glenn, promises, promising things, concerning you know, things. I, I just listened to just the banter between you and Paul, and I, um, I can tell you, and this is not tied to the fact that Paul is here, but there is this gentleman who rolls around the country um, with this thing called RoomPack, um, and we have been um, using RoomPack now for a number of years, and. Um, what you all just kind of summarized, like the utilization of technology tools to aid professional staff, uh, I think it's 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 necessary. Um, and if those tools are able to help build metrics and measures and 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 an assessment, um, I think that the data that's collected can help tell a story. Um, because I think in my role, and I think that this is the, this is this is what is needed um, across this, our country when it comes to um, making sure the resource is available for residential life, we have to convince leadership. Um, the next generation is changing. And um, I think that a lot of the decision makers, they might have this image of what residential life was, but that's from like 20 to 30 years ago. It's mm -hmm. no longer viable. Um, mm -hmm. Disruptive shifts are needed, but you need the data to tell that story, to demonstrate that if this is our mission, this is what the campus needs, our, this is what our strategic plan is, this is the data that's telling us we are effective or not effective. And as we make these shifts, we cannot bury our RAs in this process mm -hmm. because while we're trying to figure our, I won't swear, while we try to figure our stuff out, <laughs> we need to make sure that we are paying attention to the RAs because they're students first. 
Thanks, Glenn. We don't have to mark explicit on the podcast. So thank you for that. Uh, sometimes we do, and that's great too. Um, we are running out of time. Uh, this podcast is called Student Affairs Now. We always like to end by asking our guests, what are you thinking, troubling, or pondering now? It might be related to this conversation or other things that are just really present with you. What are you pondering now? If you want to share with folks how they can connect with you, that's great too. Uh, Glenn, what are you troubling now? Uh, not troubling me, but actually pondering. I really like what Heather said about admissions. Um, mm -hmm. It's making me re rethink that I don't have a deep um, connection with our admission, but I, I sit in the same room with them and I'm seeing the the who's coming in um, and I need to better partner with them. So the, that literally is like writing, I wrote it down like to do, you know, missions, watch out, I'm coming. All right, <laughs> Paul, how about you? Uh, I mentioned ChatGPT twice in this podcast, so mm -hmm. I'm going to mention it a third time. Um, I've been experimenting with it. I've been asking it Resonance Life related questions. We've been putting out posts on the blog every Friday of random questions that I've been asking ChatGPT. And it's really, in, I've learned a lot in terms of what it can do well and what mm -hmm. it can't do well. And the brief preview is, you know, if you want it to write a poem, to mm -hmm. residence hall leaders at the start of the academic year, it actually does a pretty good job. So you'll see that coming out in a little bit. But oddly, um, I said, write a, write a script for a series of intentional conversations at six points in the year over the course of a student's first year in the residence halls. And it was eerily good. So <laughs> like, like eerily good that with like a little polishing, like you'd be like, I would have assumed a human came up with this. So my thing is experimenting with that and seeing what it's, there's some things it's not good at, but um, there are some things where it is good and it's fascinating. So I'd encourage people, if you haven't just played around with it, throw it random questions, see what it comes up with. It's really, it's really fascinating, I think. Awesome. And Heather, what, what's with you now? Yeah, I, I think a lot about staff retention, working at a smaller campus, when people leave it, you feel it more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so staff retention and also just creating a culture where people feel valued and cared for and meaning in their work is something really important for me. Um, yeah, and if you wanna connect with me, if you look me up, you'll see a, music, a musician. I am her first cousin by marriage, um, but Heather mm -hmm. Krupp, I will name it, and I'm happy to be connected over Instagram or email. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks to all three of you. This has been terrific. I really appreciate your ideating and your willingness to share some thoughts that maybe aren't fully actualized. We're not here sharing our massive success stories, but really innovating and ideating. I think it's you've given folks a lot of things to think about. So, so thanks to all three of you for being here today. And thanks to our sponsor of today's episode, Room Pact, which got several shout outs today. Uh, Room Pack started as and remains a family owned business with a mission to help residence life and education professionals and the residents they serve. This includes helping staff be more efficient with administrative processes and providing them with access to real time assessment and engagement data for insights into residents educational journeys. From curriculum to program and community development models, Room Pack does it all. Room Pact is committed to its values as a certified B Corp that does right by the planet, its employees, and the campus it serves, and the field of residence life and student housing as a whole. Also a shout out as always to our producer, Nat Ambrosi, who does all the behind the scenes work to make us look and sound good. Uh, we love the support for these important conversations from our community. You can help us reach even more folks by subscribing to the podcast. Uh, on Apple, on YouTube, uh, wherever you get your podcasts, and signing up for our weekly newsletter, announcing each new episode and more. If you're so inclined, you can also leave us a five-star review. We'd love that. I'm Keith Edwards. Thanks again to the fabulous guests today and to everyone who's watching and listening. Make it a great week, all. <laughs>